and it should be recording. Okay. All right. So again, welcome everybody. As Dara mentioned, my name is Richard Hinton and I'm with the uh, Youth Mappers uh, Network and uh, more specifically, I'm at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. I work for the Department of Geography and I'm the manager of the Validation Hub. So one of the things we want to do with the Validation Hub is to help people become better mappers as part of our network and, and, and the Open Street Map community at large. So what we aim to do is offer trainings every so often to help people become better mappers and better validators um, with their data. So today we're going to be doing an intro to Jossum because that is the primary tool that we use for validation. Down the road, um, we'll have a, um, a validation training as well. We haven't put that on the books yet. It may not happen until next year, but do look for other training events from us uh, coming down uh, coming down the road. So before I get, go any further, I'd like to introduce a few other members of the Validation Hub that are here with me today. Um, today I have uh, Kenneth Derryberry, um, Maxwell Uwasu, and May Harrison. So I'd like each of them just to say hi and uh, tell us a little bit about what you're studying, and then we'll continue on with the training. Uh, Maxwell, uh, Kenneth, sorry, Kenneth. Hi, I'm Kenneth. I'm an undergraduate um, junior at the George Washington University, and I'm studying geography and political science. Um, and I will be assisting Richard with the presentation and demo today. And I've been a part of the Youth Mappers Validation Hub since May. Awesome. Max Hi, everyone. Um, I am Max Olausu, and I'm doing my master's in geography at the George Washington University. I joined the validation app just in August, and yeah, I'll be supporting in this training. So good to have you all around. Um, hi, I'm May Harrison. I'm an undergraduate senior at the George Washington University, um, where I'm studying international affairs and geography. And I've been part of the hub um, since early October. Yeah, welcome. We're excited to have you here. Okay, great. Thank you, folks. And let me get the next presentation started and I'll talk about the actual um, training that we're going to do today. So let me share my screen. Okay, so you should be seeing our, our opening slide here. So the plan for today is that myself and Kenneth will lead you through a number of slides that where we'll talk about JOSM and how to use some of its tools. And then following that, uh, we will actually have a demo where Kenneth will take you through using a number of the tools that you'll see here and give you an idea of, of how you can actually use them. If you have JOSM already installed, when we get to the demo part, if you wanna try and follow along and use some of those tools, that's awesome, that's great. Um, as well, through the course of the lecture and during the demo, if you have questions, please post them in the uh, in the chat window, and we'll try to address those as we uh, as we move through, so they're not uh, left lingering too long. Um, but we do welcome any and all who um, can um, uh, can you know provide uh, sorry ask questions, and we will do our best to answer them uh, as we go through. So um, if everybody's ready, we will get the party started and move on to the first uh, to the first set of slides here. My computer wants to work. There we are. So we're going to start a sort of step one. What is JOSM? JOSM is the Java OpenStreetMap editor, and it is separate from ID. If you're used to seeing the ID editor or using the ID editor, you know that it's an in-browser editor. There's nothing you need to download or install. JOSM is different. JOSM is a separate application that you need to download and install on your computer. And they develop it so it doesn't matter what um, what sort of operating system you're working with, if you're running a PC or a Mac or a Linux, it will run, there's a version that will run on all of those systems. Now it's, it's been around for a while and it has some out of an intimidating interface as you'll sort of see in a second, but it is very stable and has a lot of great tools. And it works a little differently from ID in that instead of being, as I mentioned, an in-browser editor, what you do with JOSM is once you have it installed, you actually download a number, a bunch of data um, into JOSM from OSM, and then you edit it sort of offline. You edit it separately from the OSM uh, um, in a database. Once you're done your edits, then you'll push them back up. All right, so it's a, sort of a different, uh, more deliberate exchange of pulling the data down, doing your edits, then pushing them back up. And then when it does so, 
it actually does a number of topological validation checks. So it'll look for roads that cross each other but don't have a node at that intersection. It'll look for roads going through buildings or buildings that overlap. So these sort of topological errors, these things that don't really exist in real life, it will flag those for you and give you, give you an opportunity to fix them before it actually uh, reconciles them with the OSM database. And it also has a number of great shortcuts. So once you get familiar with using the tools, you can actually become very efficient mapper using Jossip. I mentioned the um, interface can be a little intimidating. I'm not sure when this was the, when it was designed, but it hasn't sort of the GUI hasn't been really updated since, but that's fine. It's very stable. It has a lot of tools and a lot of information going on here, but in a few slides, we'll actually try to break that down and make it a little less, a um, little less intimidating. In this presentation, we always provide a number of links. As I mentioned, this uh, presentation will be available and the recording will be available as well. So Jawson has been around, around a long time. So there are lots of uh, resources out there. So we wanted to to provide you with those, because again, these are the first steps to get you introduced to Jossum. Now, if you know Jossum a little bit, hopefully you will learn a few tricks and, and tips through this presentation. But we wanted to provide you with a series or a, sort of a fairly robust list of resources you can go to after the fact to learn more um, about how to use Jossum in various scenarios. So the first step, as I mentioned, it's not an in-browser application. So we're not going to touch on this, but just sort of highlight the key points here is that you need to download and install the application. So it is it is based on Java, Java OpenStreetMap Editor. It's in the name. So you do need to have at least Java 8 or higher installed on your computer, and it's free to install. The nice thing is that when you download and install and attempt to install Jossum, it will look at your computer, and if it does not have the appropriate version of Java, it will prompt you to go to the Java site and actually download it. So you don't have to worry about going to Java first necessarily, because if I go to the next slide here, when you, if you go right to the Jossum site and download the appropriate version for your operating system, and you start the install process, it'll get to a certain point and check this, to make sure you have an appropriate version of Java installed. And if it doesn't, it will prompt you to go to Java website, download that, then come back and finish the install. So it is fairly sort of fairly simple. Install doesn't take a whole lot of time, um, but you need to make sure you install the appropriate version for your operating system. And of course, have at least Java 8 or higher installed on your computer. All right, so we just want to talk about the interface a little bit. I mentioned that, as you saw, it can be a little intimidating. So let's sort of try and break that down a little bit to make sure we have a better understanding of what we're actually looking at. When you first open it, it looks pretty sort of benign um, and generic. You simply have some menu items across the top and a few uh, buttons and tools across the top. And then if your version is um, a little dated, you'll see you should update at the top. And oftentimes you can keep using the version you have. At some point, if it finds you have too old of a system, then it will prompt you to, no, no, you need to update because some of the functions aren't working quite uh, quite as well as they should. But as you see on the, on the, on the screenshot here, um, the updates come out fairly regularly, right? They, they, they do come out regularly, so you don't have to worry about updating like every month, but once or twice a year probably is a good idea to make sure you're keeping, keeping current with the most updated um, patches and connections. Once you have it installed, the first thing you want to do is set up the authorization. Because it is a tool that works with OSM, you won't actually be able to push any information up to the OSM servers unless you use your OSM credentials to log in. So under the preferences tab, so sorry, under edit, and then you go to the preferences, it'll bring up a window. And then you can click on the sort of authorization or authorize now section and put in your OSM credentials to so that you can show the software that yes, you are an OSM contributor, and here are my credentials. Without this, you won't be able to actually push any, uh, any, any of your edits up to the OSM uh, database. And just uh, a little note here that um, on the bottom here, I mentioned that depending on the operating system you're using and the version, the, the windows you see here may be slightly different. So the path to get them going to preferences, still through the edit menu and going to preferences, but some of the uh, items may look slightly different depending on the operating system you're working with. Don't worry, the information is there. 
Another important and key thing to set up, especially for the work that oftentimes we do, where we're working with the tasking manager, which we'll get into later, um, we need to set up what is called the remote control. Again, under preferences, on the left-hand side, you'll see a, uh, an icon that looks like a sort of a TV remote control. And you click on that and you want to enable remote control. This will enable JOSM and the tasking manager to speak to each other. And this is very important when you're actually pulling data down from the tasking manager, which we'll talk about a little bit later, right? So with those two things set up, you're most of the way there. A couple of tools that we always highly recommend, and anybody who uses JOSM regularly to trace features, especially you know uh, buildings and roads, um, we really um, encourage people to download these two plugins: the building, the buildings uh, tools plugin, and the utils plugin too. Um, those two are sort of really important. The cool thing with JOSM is that it has a bunch of inherent tools, but also has all these plugins that extend its capabilities and give you some really cool sort of um, tools that make your life easier as a a uh, contributor to OSM. So again, under preferences, you will see an icon that looks like a blue um, jigsaw puzzle piece. You click on that, that brings up the window where you can search for various plugins. And so the first one you mentioned here is buildings. When you start, when you start to type in the search window of buildings, you'll see the list of plugins filter. Simply check that box on, and then that will eventually go load the uh, buildings tool. And then while we're in that same window, look for the utils plugin too, and then check that box. And another one that we find quite handy is Mapathoner. With those three checked, at the bottom of that screen, you'll see a download list, and it will download those, those plugins to your uh, JOSM instance. The nice thing is that while you're using that install of JOSM, you don't need to reinstall those plugins. You don't have to go through the step each time. Sometimes you'll be up, um, prompted to update the plugins, which you should do, but sometimes there are patches and, and new versions of the same plugins, but you don't have to reinstall the plugins each time. So those tools are very, very useful, and we'll see some of those a little bit later. So now that we have our authorization through uh, OSM created and we have our plugins sort of set up, let's look at the sort of the window to how we navigate and how we understand the actual interface for uh, JOSM. So of course, the biggest piece of real estate is for our map the area of interest we're mapping, and that takes up the most uh, space on our, um, on, our, on our GUI. And it'll have the satellite imagery, it'll have OSM data that have been traced, and any traces you created, of course, will go in there as well. On the left-hand side, you'll see a list of uh, edit tools. And one of the big differences between JOSM and, say, the ID editor is that JOSM has only one editing tool, and that one um, tool to create edits, be it a point, a line, or a polygon, you use the same tool. In ID Editor, as you know, there is a point uh, tab, a line tab, and an area tab, they call it to make create polygons. So you choose a tool before you actually trace or, um, the actual feature. Whereas in JOSM, you only have the one tool. And if it's a point, you simply double click in one place. If it's a line, you click once and then you to make a line with those um, those points and then a polygon, you simply close that line on itself. So it's all with the one tool. Like many software across the top, you have a main menu where you have your file, your edit, your view, your tools. And depending on the plugins you add, you will get different tools and different menus come up. So for, for instance, with the utils plugin two plugin, um, the more tools option will come up and give you sort of more tools to work with vector data. You also have a shortcut bar right below that. So you have a number of um, options there to download data, to upload data. But you also have a number of other uh, sort of shortcuts that will help you uh, do things. We'll show you sort of one of those a little bit later. And then on the right-hand side, it can get very congested, but you have, a no you have a choice of a various number of panels that you can put in here for very specific information. A couple of the most important ones are the layers panel. This will actually identify what imagery you have, and then the data layer itself will be on top. And that's the data that you're actually working with. You download data from OSM, that will be in that particular layer. And then any data you add will be in that layer. When you push up your data, that's the layer, that's the data that gets pushed back up to the OSM servers. Um, again, if you have Maxar imagery, Bing imagery, uh, anything like this, all of the layers that are displayed on the map itself will be listed here. And again, much like a, much like a GIS, the order in which you have those layers or the order in which they draw. So I have my Bing layer here and then my Maxar layer here. 
I can't see Bing because Macs are literally on top of it. So you need to turn that off so you can see the Bing layer. The other very important one that you'll have is the tags and memberships panel. And here, this is where you'll see what a feature, particular feature has been tagged as. So if you see a building or a road and you want to see how it's been tagged, you can select that road and any tags and memberships that have been associated to that particular feature will show up in that window. Okay, so that gives you a general idea of, um, of the interface. And again, with those panels, you can turn on or off as many as you like. Now, obviously, the more you have in there, the more sort of uh, cramped it's going to get, the smaller they'll get and be harder to read. So I typically keep it to three or four, depending on what I'm doing. All right, at that, I'm going to pass it over to Kenneth. Yeah, are there any questions at this point? If not, I'm going to talk about mapping features using Jawson. So the first thing that you have to do when um, you're mapping features is that you need to download the OSM data. Um, one way to do this is click on File Download um, from OSM, or you can simply click on the Download button, which is that green downward facing arrow. In the download window that opens, you want to select the Slippy Map tab um, and use your mouse to pan and zoom into an area that you know very well, such as your hometown or your neighborhood. Um, draw a box around the area that you want to download and then click download at the bottom of the window. And Jossum will get the data for this area from OpenStreetMap and open it in your map window for editing. Um, there are other ways to specify the area that you want to download. Um, for instance, if you log on to www.osm.org and search or zoom into your area of interest um, and then copy the URL from your browser And then um, if you, you can download this data by pasting the URL from OpenStreetMap site into JOSM. If you file pull down to open location, or you can also hit control and the L key. Um, and this window will pop up in the image that says enter URL to download. And here you will paste the link that you just copied from your browser. And then again, click that green downward facing arrow to download the URL. You can activate and deactivate the visibility of any layer that you've downloaded into JOSM. Um, and the way that you do this is by clicking the little eye icon um, next to the name of the layer. So if you can see the eye symbol there, that that means um, your layer is visible. And if you just see an empty oval, that means that it's not and that it's not visible. And clicking either of those will switch and toggle it to the other one. Um, you can change the order alignment of your layers by dragging them higher or lower um, in that layers window. Um, you can increase and decrease the transparency of layers. You can merge a previously downloaded layer with a new one, um, which would be taking data layer one and data layer two into one layer, for example. Um, you can duplicate a layer and you can delete a layer. Um, so it's very important to have a proper imagery setup um, once you've downloaded your data. Um, the imagery may load automatically for your task, depending on where you downloaded it from. But if it does not, you'll need to activate the correct imagery layer. And to do this, you'll open the imagery menu pull down um, and then check the project instructions for the project that you're working on. And based on what it says there, you'll select the correct imagery layer from this drop down menu. Um, so most projects will specify and say, use Bing imagery for this project or use Maxar imagery for this project or whichever one of those. Um, and as you can see in the image, you'll go to imagery and then pull down to the specific one specified in the project instructions. Um, so imagery visibility is also something that you can change and it can be helpful to adjust the visibility of your imagery layers in JOSM. The visibility of the layer can be adjusted with a series of sliders um, that you can see being opened up in the image to the right. Increasing the gamma tends to make features pop out of the landscape more, which can be useful when you're focused on mapping the features of the landscape. 
Um, and it's also good practice to compare imagery sources when you are mapping because um, it allows you to sort of get a second opinion and compare um, different imagery for the same area. Um, and additional layers can be added by selecting them from the imagery menu. So just as I discussed before, you can go back to that imagery pull down. And for example, if the instructions suggest using Bing imagery and you wanna to compare to a different one, you might select Maxar as well. And then in your layers, you'll see Bing and Maxar, and you can toggle the visibility, you can drag one higher or lower, and you can click them on and off um, and, and see and compare the two imageries um, as you are mapping. Next slide. I'm sorry, next slide. Are there any questions in the meantime? <clears throat> Kenneth, I have a, more of a fun question, not necessarily a technical question. Um, but what would you say your favorite tool or add on on at Jossum is? That is a good question. Um, I have to say, I think the buildings tool is my favorite um, because it really makes it simple to map um, square buildings uh, very quickly. Uh, and I find that being a common task that I have to do. So it's pretty useful. Yeah, absolutely. Would anyone else like to share what their favorite add-on or tool is on Jawsome? Um, I'm not sure if it's a super exciting tool, but okay. I really enjoy the reverse ways um, tool because I think it's cool how you can take um, a segment um, like a road and reverse, um, say if it's like a one way street, you can reverse the um, direction that the road is going. It also makes a big impact on the road network in whatever area you're mapping as well. Cool. Thank you, May. Okay, at least for me, Richard, now the screen is dark. It's black. I don't know if that's better or worse, but we're getting there, right? Okay, I'll ask another a pop question um, that's more on, again, not the technical side, but the fun side. What would you say has been your most interesting edit um, or 
maybe like a feature or something that you haven't necessarily seen in person, but you got to map it over imagery. So those are two questions if anyone would like to answer. Maybe Kenneth, if you want to go first. Sure. On the spot, um, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, one thing that was pretty cool uh, was I was doing some mapping in the Philippines um, and I believe it was um, like a, an indigenous um, heritage site. And there were some pretty interesting um, features um, in a little area of one of the cities um, that were both interesting to map and it seemed like a significant um, local hub for the community. And so that was a pretty neat thing to map. <laughs> Oh, that's really cool. Did you learn about it by like reading the instructions or did you just go, did you research it like afterwards? It just I, seemed... I, yeah, I, I did a little bit of research. Okay, makes sense. <laughs> Would anyone else like to share basically what their favorite edit has been? I can share. Um, yesterday I was doing some validating in Peru and I haven't gotten a chance um, up until this point to map more physical features, but um, I was mapping and validating like cliffs and um, like intermittent streams, which was really cool. Um, and I hadn't seen that because um, most of the validating and mapping I've done has been in more urban areas. So this was cool to map the more physical geography and actual features um, of a landscape. Mm -hmm. Great. Very cool. Thank you, May. And we do have a question in the chat from Lassine. So he's asking how he can see the date of it, the imagery in Jossum. That is a good question. Um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but let me see. <laughs> okay. So we will get back to your question, Lucy. Thank you for your question. And maybe while um, Kenneth is looking that up, would anyone like to share why it's important to have the date for imagery? Um, no, I just want to congratulate you about your idea for the new. So I, I, I follow the communications, everyone, but I'll give my best guess and someone can correct me if I'm wrong. But I imagine it, it's because over the years, there's obviously changes to the land. There's new buildings, there's new roads. So in order to, if, to make sure that you are um, updating the map with the most up-to-date information, you would want whatever imagery you're using to be the newest imagery. Um, but that also comes in with what Kenneth was saying about the different imagery and the different kinds that you would need to use and the different qualities. So I'm sure that it's dependent on the situation and you should always follow with the instructions um, or usually follow what the instructions advise with that. Please, someone correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> no, you're right. I uh, the, the dating of the imagery is really important. As you said, it by using the most recent imagery and the most clear imagery, you can get the best idea of what the area actually looks like today. Um, it's also important if you're toggling between imagery, sometimes there's more cloud cover or um, a little bit clearer visibility using one imagery um, instead of another. So having, knowing which imagery is the correct one to use, like through the instructions, or also just toggling between your options um, can be helpful to get the best idea of where buildings exactly are, how roads are connected, things like that. Because there's a lot of change um, throughout the years or even within a few months um, that we may not be aware of, but changing the imagery can be really helpful. Um, and I believe Jossum does automatically take the newest imagery from um, the, like from Maxar or from Bing or Esri. Um, so it's always, always using the most recent imagery, but sometimes the imagery itself um, is better or worse depending on cloud cover, things like that. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. 
And we've got a couple more comments in the chat. So first I'll jump down to uh, someone who also added the date is really helpful in giving an idea of features that have changed over time when mapping. So that is a really cool function. There's something called open historical map. So that's outside of OpenStreetMap and you can actually see um, features develop over the years um, that's actually been mapped. So you can check that out. And then the other question we have on the chat is, is it possible to access the metadata of the imagery? So I was um, attempting to both do some research and uh, try it out in Jossum. <clears throat> I was able to find that if you right click on the um, imagery layer within the layer sidebar that I was just discussing, um, you can pull down and click on info. Um, however, I did just attempt doing that with both Bing and Maxar, which is our two pretty common imagery choices. And unfortunately, there wasn't very much data available. Um, I couldn't find a date for either of those or um, other things that you would typically find in metadata. Um, so I, I wonder if that might be something um, Richard knows the answer to when he gets a chance. Okay, so Richard emailed us and the, so apparently from the chat, Zoom has frozen for him. So I am going to either, Kenneth, did you have the slides? Yeah, I can present. That would be great. Um, yeah, let's go with that. Thank you for that message, May. I recognize it probably wasn't. <laughs> Um, wait, is that, do you see the presentation? It's black for me. Um, okay. How about, you can also send me now. the link. Oh, now, there we are, we are editing. Okay, you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, okay, so I was just um, doing an overview of imagery visibility, and um, we were talking about how additional layers um, can be helpful to compare, especially um, May had a good point there about cloud cover. Um, sometimes one imagery can have cloud cover and the other one doesn't. So again, it can be useful to compare um, multiple different imageries. Um, so now moving on to editing, um, we can add points, lines, and shapes that represent real life locations using JOSM. In JOSM, um, points are referred to as nodes, lines are referred to as ways, and shapes are referred to as closed ways or areas interchangeably. And I'll get to more on that in just a little bit. Um, to make edits, we use the draw tool to draw new nodes, ways, and areas. And then we describe these objects by selecting tags from the presets menu. One important thing to note here is that you should never edit the map outside of the area you have downloaded. So if you see the image at the bottom of this slide, um, you can see sort of the yellow diagonal dashed um, lines, and that indicates area outside of the area you have downloaded. Um, so make sure never to cross that box when you are making edits, um, because the only area that has been locked and selected for you is the area that you can see in that center square, but the dashed area outside is not part of your locked editing area. So um, some important basic operations while using JOSM. Um, for your basic navigation, the right button on your mouse is what you're going to use to drag the map around. So clicking and dragging with the right mouse button will allow you to pan and zoom around the map. Um, clicking with your left mouse button allows you to manipulate an element. And so that can be used um, when you're selecting things or when you're adding new features. Um, and then also importantly, the scroll wheel allows you to zoom in and out so that you can change the scale at which you are viewing the data. Oops. Um, so there are three main modes of operation when editing. Um, first is the select mode and you can toggle into select mode by pressing the S key on your keyboard. And this is used for selecting elements, viewing and editing their tags and moving them. Um, select, I sort of personally view as like the neutral mode. Um, and I use that when I'm 
dragging around the screen and just selecting um, elements that already exist. The add um, mode, which you can get to by pressing the A key on your keyboard is what you use for adding new elements. And I, I view using the add mode as more when you are making edits to the features that exist in, in a more major way. Um, and add allows you to add new elements such as new standalone nodes. Um, you can add new nodes to create a new way. You can extend an existing way um, and you can alter areas that already exist. Um, or you can create any of these elements um, brand new as well. And then the last mode that's also important um, is the delete mode, which you can use for deleting elements. Um, and you can toggle this by hitting the control key and delete key. And one important thing to note here is that um, when using JOSM and when using OSM, this is a collaborative um, community of mappers who are all working together to contribute to creating a map. So um, it's important to not use the delete mode unless it's really necessary, especially if you're working with features that were already there before you began, uh, before you began editing, um, because we want to respect the work of everyone that has um, been involved in this process. So when there are features there already that you're able to simply alter or edit a little bit rather than deleting and making a new one, um, that's a goal that we strive for. Um, however, it's appropriate to use the delete key, especially if it's on your own edits that you've just made in that session. Oops. Um, so here are the JOSM basic elements, and I touched on these before. Um, nodes are the dots that are used to mark specific locations um, or for drawing the segments between these locations. Um, no, nodes are points in space, and each node has um, a designated latitude and longitude. So there's an exact um, place that each node exists in. Um, ways are the next level up, and that's an ordered list of nodes displayed as connected by line segments. So it's one node with a segment connected to the next, connected to the next. And these are used to describe roads and paths and rivers and any pathways that are linear in nature. Um, and then lastly, um, there's a closed way, which I prefer area, but both are used. Um, and these are ways which go in a closed loop. Um, so when you close off your way while you're creating it and click the uh, initial node again, um, that will close it off and create an area. And these are used to describe areas of your map like parks, lakes, islands, or buildings. So first, um, when drawing a node, Nodes are typically standalone by themselves. Um, so what you want to do is clear your current selection by pressing edit, unselect all, or pressing the escape button on your computer. Um, then you're gonna press A and toggle into add mode as I was discussing before. And, um, or you can select draw nodes in the left toolbar to begin drawing a node. And then if you press the left mouse button somewhere in the map view window and press escape, and then you can double click to create a node. And each different time that you double click once, that will create a new node on a different part of the map. And once you have created um, all the nodes that you want to and you're satisfied with that, you can click the select, uh, sorry, you can return to select mode um, by pressing the S key on your keyboard or by using a toolbar. So the next level up is drawing a way. Um, and to do this, you're going to click the left mouse button again somewhere, but this time only once. When you double click, that indicates that you are making only one node and you will be finishing that off. But when you want to draw away, you're just gonna click the mouse once and then um, go to the next point of your pathway where you want to add another node to keep continuing the line um, and then click again and another node will appear and it will be joined to the first node by the segment of a way. Um, and then you're going to keep clicking along your pathway um, to draw a way with several nodes and segments on it. Finally, once you're done and you want to stop, um, you can either go back to the select mode by pressing the S key, you can press the escape button on your computer, or, and this is what I typically do because I find it the easiest, when you reach the final node that you want to map, you can just double click and that will finish off your way. Um, so now I'm going to talk about mapping roads, which is an important and common occurrence within JOSM. Um, to do this, you want to activate um, 
the draw nodes tool by selecting A and that will put you into the add mode. Um, <clears throat> then you want to trace the road and finish it by double clicking on the final point. So as I discussed, you're going to click once at each place that you want to put place a node along that um, way. And when you reach the final one, you're going to double click and that will finish off your way. After this, um, you're going to add a tag to the road. And there's a few ways to do this, but tagging is very important um, because creating the feature is the first step, um, but to help OSM and JOSM identify, well, what is this feature that has been created? It's very important to tag it um, so that the program knows what specific feature you have just created. Um, and so there's a few different ways to do this, but one is by hitting the Alt key and the A key, and then you're going to enter key equals highway, um, and you'll see in the pop-up here, please select a key. There you would select highway, and then um, you also need to choose a linked value. And to figure out what to use for this, you want to check the project instructions, or you can examine a road tagging wiki to decide on what the best value is. Um, but often it will either be residential or unclassified. And yeah, um, edit a tag for a road by hitting the Alt key and the S key. Um, and then next is mapping land use. Um, and in mapping land use, you're going to be creating areas as opposed to ways. Um, and to do this, you want to activate the draw nodes tool by selecting A and switching into add mode. And you want to start tracing the uh, you want to start tracing the land use outline and finish the shape by double clicking on the original point where you first began the way. Um, again, tagging is important here, and you want to tag this feature by selecting the add button within the tags memberships window to the right. Kenneth, uh, you're muted right now. Oh, thank Bye. you. Um, how, how long was I muted? Just for about two seconds. That okay. was my fault. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, so yeah, just reviewing that. Um, so again, you want to tag this land use. Um, as I said before, there's a few ways to do this, but um, one way is using the add button within the tags memberships window to the right, or as I discussed um, previously with the ways, there's another way to do it where you hit the alt key and the A key um, and have this um, pop up here. Um, and for residential areas like the one shown in the image, the, the key used is land use and the value is residential. Um, and you want to type these values into the tagging fields and then press OK, and your new area will be tagged. Are there any questions at this point? Kenneth, I'm back on uh, online now, uh, so I can I can give you a break if you like. OK, yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, are there any any questions at this time? Um, apologies again for the uh, technical issues. All of a sudden, I Zoom locked, uh, froze on me, and I couldn't even send a message in the chat window um, or unmute myself or anything. And uh, so, thank you, Kenneth and Dara and May and Maxwell and stuff for for keeping the keeping the show going. Um, and thank you, everybody, for your patience. But hopefully, fingers crossed and touching wood, everything runs smoothly now. All right. So as you heard um, from Kenneth just now, but the tagging, the tagging, of course, is very, very important in OSM, uh, regardless if you're working in ID or in JOSM, um, because if you don't tag every feature you create, then it's just a piece of um, vector data that's sort of hanging out in the database with no sort of association. The, the OSM has no idea how what it is, doesn't know how to render it, and no one else who looks at the OSM data will have an idea either. So OSM has created, as you sort of just heard from Kenneth, this sort of key value pairing that, um, that it, that it uh, uses for every single feature. So the key is the overarching sort of the larger general classification of the actual feature. And the value is a more specific sort of um, characteristic of that feature. So if you're using a key of highway, you can further specify what kind of highway, if it's primary, secondary, tertiary, et cetera. So that's how the key value pairing sort of works together in uh, in OSM. So again, keys are sort of more generic by in about more generic, and then the values give more sort of specific characteristics. When you are typing them in, 
um, make sure you use uh, underscores. Sorry, make sure you use lowercase. Uppercase letters aren't aren't, uh, aren't used. Um, so with uh, presets, it's uh, and tagging. Well, let me back up. When you create a feature, you click the add button to under the tags and membership window. You'll get this window pop up, and you'll be offered to place in the key and the value characteristics. The nice thing is that when you select a particular key, so you hit the drop down, you'll be listed all of the possible keys within RSM. Once you select a particular one, such as highway, for the value selection, you're only given the values um, that are appropriate for that key. Like uh, similarly, if you trace a point versus a polygon, right? You, you drop in one node as a versus a, an area, the key and value dropdowns will be appropriately um, selected as well. So they, they'll be filtered based on the type of feature you are creating. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you are um, creating a, I don't know, a point, you're not going to get um, the probably won't get the you know the the building tags. Oh, actually, you will. I'm trying to think of a good example where one feature won't be used as another one um, because you do filter them based on the geometry type and then what key you use will then uh, filter out what uh, what values you can have. Okay, we'll keep moving here. One of the cool tools that you have in the uh, top menu of Jawson are at using presets. So if you're not sure um, of what the what the key value uh, pairing would be, but you know what the object is and you're tracing them, you can use the presets. Um, or when you get used to using presets, it'll actually do all that tagging with the key and value pairing for you. And as soon as it has that key value pair, of course, it'll actually render it uh, accordingly. So there are a number of presets that have been created for highways, water. You see some of them here, like under man-made. Um, then you have like towers and flagpoles and chimneys and whatnot. So you can actually use those sort of fairly quickly in when you're tracing those kind of features if you if you choose to do so. Buildings, one of the sort of biggest things that we trace. And if you're new to JOSM and not uh, and have only experienced tracing buildings using the uh, ID editor, then the buildings tool may blow your mind because it's a bit of a game changer. The buildings tool that we install installed at the beginning or we talked about at the beginning uh, using the buildings tool plugin. The shortcut to activate this particular plugin is the letter B on your keyboard. When you click that, you'll see that the cursor changes from uh, the arrow to a crosshair. And in the lower right corner of that crosshair, you'll see a little building icon show up, the little, little, little brick looking building icon show up. When you use that building tool to create buildings, all you need to do is trace that long edge of the building and then drag out to the width of it and click and you're done. It'll ensure that every corner you draw is square, it's 90 degrees, it's plumb. And it will also tag the building as building equals yes. So the most generic sort of tagging of a building is all taken care of. So you can do many, many buildings much more quickly than, than it takes to do so do the same number of buildings in ID. All right, so really it really sort of uh, speeds things up when you're when you're using it. And if you get handy with the shortcuts, you have one hand on your mouse to do tracing and the other hand on the keyboard switching between the different shortcuts, you can really start cooking along with making these features. Another handy tool that goes um, helps you edit buildings in particular is the extrude tool. You, again, all these tools you can find under the menu somewhere, but there are also shortcuts for them. The shortcut for the extrude tool is X. And again, you will see the cursor actually change. So when you use the extrude tool, um, you'll actually see this right angle triangle appear in the bottom right of the cursor. So you have the crosshair for the building tool, looks like a little, little brick building. And then when you use the extrude tool, um, it'll change that right angle triangle, right angle triangle. The extrude tool enables you to create features or create buildings that are say L-shaped or T-shaped that have bump outs of some sort and will keep all the angles and the lines plumb and parallel perpendicular. So using the tool, you can add a node into the middle of a line where it needs to be and then simply select that line that needs to be bumped out and drag it out as you see in this, uh, in this little video here. So as you draw the building, you change, use the building tool to draw the, uh, draw the actual basic shape of the building. And then you change to the extrude tool and you can click on the line, go 
double click on the line to add a node and then simply click on the line you wish to move out and then the building now reflects what's on the ground. Next slide, please. Another cool tool is the circular tool or draw circular building tool. So changing from the building tool to the circular building tool, you simply hit Alt and then the Z key at the same time. And again, you see the cursor change, so you know what sort of tracing building mode you're in. And all you need to do is draw the diameter of that circular building, and then it will draw the appropriate number of nodes to articulate that as a circle, and it will tag it as building again. So it takes a lot of the work, or some of the work, I should say, for every single feature that you're doing sort of off your plate and helps you do so much more efficiently. To switch back out of the draw building mode to regular building uh, mode, simply click Alt R. Buildings with courtyards. This is a, a sort of can be a tricky one, especially in um, in uh, ID editor. It becomes a little more tricky, especially to make sure the courtyards are plumb perpendicular to the existing buildings. But using a couple of tools, you can simply create that sort of more complex geometry in Jossum. So the idea is to break that feature down into its sort of basic components of a number of different buildings, a number of different uh, rectangles in this case. So here you see in the video, you created one rectangle. Then what he's done is selected one of that first rectangle. You see it's still selected in red. And that means every other uh, building that you create will be perpendicular and parallel to the first one. So what they're doing is creating all four that actually overlap and join with each other. And then you select all four and using the shift join shortcut or the merge uh, multiple polygons tool, it will actually merge them all into one polygon. And then both those features now have the appropriate relationship for the inner polygon and outer polygon to make this complex geometry um, pro um, properly sort of sit in the OSIM database. All right, so that's a kind of a neat trick because using the building tool, you know it's all tagged as buildings. You know the angles are all squared or all plumb. By doing multiple buildings, that are all plumb with each other because that first building again is selected. Keep that first building selected as you draw the other buildings. Then all of them will be perpendicular. They'll be plumb to each other. And then when you merge them together, you have a perfectly sort of squared building with a courtyard within it. Oftentimes we're fixing buildings and there's a couple of great tools uh, for that as well. Of course, we can square non-squared buildings like, just like you do in ID editor using the shortcut of the Q key. Um, but you also have a couple of quick tools by holding down to shift control and the control alt key. You can resize these features or you can rotate them, right? Sometimes that's all it takes. And then sometimes um, you use the extrude key to sort of manipulate the dimensions, made it shorter, fatter, longer, taller um, in some dimension. If you have two features that are stuck together, in other words, they're sort of glued together, you can unglue them, meaning so you can sort of separate those two features by using the G key, the shortcut is the G key. Again, under the menu item at the top where you have tools and more tools and, and mode and whatnot at the top of the Jossum window, you can actually find the dropdown for all these tools. You don't have to worry about memorizing all these shortcuts quite yet. A lot of those things will come, come with time. But when you have two features as you just saw in the video here, you can click the G key, select the features, hit the G key, it will separate or unglue those nodes that are selected together, that are joined together. And then you can remove one if need be um, and then adjust the um, adjust the uh, the existing feature to match the imagery that you're that you're uh, working with. So a lot of these tools will actually help you sort of really focus on these things. That's cool. Yeah, we go on. Just like with ID, you do want to upload frequently, especially if you're dealing with a lot of data um, in a geographic area. So while you're working on um, a number of edits in in OSM, upload. Press the upload button. And then when you do so, you'll be prompted with this window to again, add your chain set comment. If there are a number of sort of de default chain sets, um, you know, hashtags and such, they will automatically be loaded. But then it's always customary as an OSM to add a brief comment about what it is you did. We added buildings, say that you added buildings or fixed geometry of roads or something like this. And then as usual, identify the imagery used. If you used Bing, if you use Maxar, whatever it is, if you used some custom imagery, as you see in the example here, some sort of custom imagery tile URL is, is placed in there. So make sure you have that in there for your change that comment. And then you can click upload. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, working from the tasking manager 
where a lot of us are doing our work. I mean, some of us go around to our community and use Jossum as a, um, as a default editor, um, but a lot of us are using it from the tasking manager. So once you've identified the project you want to work in and you find the task you want to work in, you do have the option of going with the ID editor or the Jossum editor. Hopefully after this training, if you're uh, new to Jossum, or even if you've been using it for a little while, you continue to do it and you'll start using Jossum because you'll find once you get comfortable with it, it's a, it's a, it's a great tool to use in, in, with OSM data. So one of the things you can do, and I've done it with my tasking, my profile in Tasking Manager is set Jossum actually to default. The default for any uh, member come into Tasking Manager OS, uh, using your OSM credentials is the ID editor. But you can change that in your settings to make it Jossum so that when you select, um, when you select Jossum, sorry, when you select a task and you select that you want to map that task, it will take the data from that task and throw it into Jossum. The thing to remember is that you do have to have Jossum running first. So make sure you have Jossum open and running. And then when you go to the tasking manager and you select that task and you go and say you want to map that task, it'll take the data and put it into put it into Jossum. Um, and just as a reminder, speaking on the on, on that same uh, thread, remember earlier. Um, we did the remote control when we're setting up Jossum to be used. That remote control that we clicked on, that's what enables the tasking manager and Jossum to actually speak to each other. So if that, if the data is not loading into, the data are not loading into your Jossum instance and you have Jossum running, check that the remote control is checked on and then go try to load it again. Um, some, re, you know, reminders here of stuff I sort of just sort of recently said that um, when you, uh, when you go to upload and um, you're going to get a list of the various objects that you've done. And as well, it'll also actually do a lot of topological checks for you. And those will happen in the, and you'll see those in the bottom, uh, bottom right hand corner, they'll come up with sort of conflicts and whatnot. And you'll have the choice, you'll have the option to actually fix those. So any issues, if you have overlapping buildings and things like this, you should, you should try and fix those before you continue pushing up your, pushing up your data. But as I just mentioned, putting your chain set comment identify sort of what you did, specify the imagery source and um, or the source for the information, even if it's local knowledge, you should put that in there. And then continue to upload. And once it finishes uploading, let you know, and if there's more editing to do, then you continue sort of moving around that particular space and continue your edits. And like any editor, like the ID editor, um, once you put up uh, posted those edits to OSM in a short amount of time, you'll be able to see those on the uh, on, on OSM as will everybody else in the world. Uh, sometimes it takes, depending on the number, um, you know, internet connections and traffic and how much work the servers are doing, it may take uh, a little bit for your edits to show up, but they will show up um, within, you know, hopefully within a few minutes uh, of you actually saving the information. So then you, you and like I say, your grandparents, your friends um, can all see it and anybody who wants to use it can pull it down and use it for their own work. We included this uh, sort of a shortcut cheat sheet on the, on the, at the end of this presentation um, because uh, a number of years ago, some people put this together and it's quite handy. And again, it's a lot of information. There are a lot of shortcuts because there's a lot of tools and every tool, especially the most popular ones, um, have shortcuts to make it easier um, to use. Again, no need to memorize this. As you start using the tool and you start using sort of a, a, the building tool and then the extrude tool and the draw tool and the select tool, Things like this, you'll get used to what those shortcuts are. Then as you sort of slowly become more familiar with them, you can add another shortcut, add another shortcut. Um, but as you see here, there's a whole host of shortcuts, either single key or uh, uh, multiple key, like a shift Q or, or shift M or shift J and the control N, all these various things. As you start to use them, they'll become more, uh, more familiar. All right, that's it for the actual presentation part of it. We'll pause here. Um, see if there are any questions that uh, have come up and we'll address those and then Kenneth will take over the reins again and actually show you some of those things we're talking about um, with a live demo of Jossum. Richard, there is a question in the chat and the question mm -hmm. says for recording and everyone to know is how do you maintain the topology of the vector data among features sharing boundaries or network sharing nodes? How do you maintain the topology? Mm -hmm. um, that's 
sorry, my screen is doing something funny again, and I'm not going to touch it. We can um, still hear you, so that's a good okay. sign. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, the thing is, like the the nice thing with the um, Jawson was, like, as I, as I noted, as you sort of picked up on, that it will sort of identify topological issues. When you are tracing features, if they should be have coincident geometry, you need to make sure that when you're tracing them, they, those nodes snap together. That when they do join, you can always go back and check by selecting the node and then move it. And if you have, like, say, a street intersection, and um, once you select that node, if the node is in there properly, then that whole sort of that X that makes the intersection will drag together. Both those lines will drag together. If they're not connected, then you'll be able to drag one feature independent of the other, right? And same thing if they're if it's along a, um, along a boundary, um, and those boundaries should be coincident. If you move one of the nodes on that boundary because those features are sharing a node, then those boundaries should move together. So really sort of making sure things are coincident when they should be. If they shouldn't be coincident and it needs to be like a small gap between them, and I suggest sort of zooming in um, so at a much larger scale, so this because the the threshold um, for snapping is based on the uh, the scale of the map. Okay, so as you as you zoom in, um, as you zoom in, sort of the 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 real estate on your the image on your on your screen, if it's only say if it's you know two or three millimeters in in, in difference, um, when you're zoomed out, two or three millimeters could be several meters. If you're zoomed in much more, it could only be the, you know half a meter. So just try to zoom in more closely, and I think, shoot, now I know if it, is it if you hold down Control key or the Alt key, I can't recall now um, offhand. It can prevent you from snapping to the nearest node if you, if you have nodes that are very close by, but you don't want them to be coincident. You want them to be sort of near each other to prevent them from snapping together. You can, um, if somebody remembers what it is, please chime in. But you can hold down a key, and it will prevent these nodes from snapping together. So you can have sort of buildings that are very close together. But not actually, not actually have coincident geometry. Are there any other questions? I can't see the chat window. I can't see the screen. I can't see much of anything right now. Okay, Richard, I will. I'll manage the chat for you. Maxwell agreed that it is the Alt key, um, and as of right now, there are no other questions in the chat. Okay, cool. Um, I'll also also ask you to put me on mute because I have no controls over anything. Got it. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so I will get started with um, our Jossum demo. Um, oops. Can you see, uh, Java OpenStreetMap editor? Yes. OK, great. Um, so the first thing that um, you want to do when using Jawsome is make sure that you are set up correctly. Um, so the way that this works is you go to the preferences um, of Jawsome. And you only really need to do this um, when you start using Jawsome. I use Jawsome frequently, and um, I've only done this one time. Um, when I first began to use it, but it is important so that everything works. Um, I am already linked up here, um, but this is how you would um, first get connected. Um, you want to click this on the left, the OSM server tab, um, and here you'll see new access token. Um, I'm already logged in, but what you would want to do here is um, enter your um, OpenStreetMap username and password and click Authorize Now and Accept Access Token and a few other steps. Um, but once this runs through, um, it will link up your OSM account to your JOSM software. Um, the next thing that's very important is uh, the remote control. Um, JOSM will not work properly if this is not enabled. So if you see here, this box that I'm clicking, enable remote control, and the little logo looks kind of like a remote control with shooting some uh, whatever that is, beam off of it. Um, but yes, yeah, so you need to make sure that enable remote control is checked. And then lastly, there's the plugins tab. Um, we've discussed a, no a number of plugins already today, but they can be very useful um, when you're going about using Jawsome. Um, here, you can view all of the um, plugins that you have 
um, downloaded already. But if you want to download new plugins, you can go to all. There's the option to search up plugins. For example, if I didn't have this building tools plugin, which is pretty useful, I, I could check that one. Um, and you can check as many plugins as you want. And once they're all checked, you click this download list, um, downward facing arrow, and that will um, download to your Jossum all of the plugins that you've selected. And they'll be there for as long as you use Jossum. Um, they might need to be updated every now and then, but um, that's just a small thing. So yeah, once you've done your authorization, your remote control and your plugins, um, you're ready to load data to the map. Um, so I'll be demonstrating this using um, Hot Tasking Manager, but there are other ways to load data as we have discussed earlier. Um, so yeah, if I'm using Hot Tasking Manager here on this project that I've selected, um, and this um, available for mapping tile is the one that I want to download and work on, I first need to make sure that the editor is chosen as Jossum. Um, and now that I've done the authorization and the remote control, um, Jossum will be able to link up to this and download the data. Um, and I'm going to say map selected task. Now, as I'm mapping this, um, it's very important to make sure that I am considering the instructions of, um, of this project. Um, and this is going to lead me through and indicate some important things. Um, one thing to note here is, as I discussed in the presentation, most projects will suggest which imagery they want you to use. And because the first thing that you want to do when you download data into JOSM is um, make sure that your imagery is correct, um, this is very key. So as we can see here, it suggests use Bing imagery. Um, so sometimes the imagery will be automatically loaded. Um, this project, the, the Bing that they've attempted to use doesn't seem to be working because it's giving me an error. Um, so here, uh, we're over in the layers window. Um, as I have uh, discussed, and I'm going to click this little trash can icon to delete that, that layer. Um, oh, sorry, one thing that I forgot is um, overviewing the interface of Jossum. Um, as Richard discussed, up here at the top is our main menu bar that has um, a number of different options um, and pull down menus that can be very useful. Um, we also have toolbars at the left, and these can be very helpful. Um, this is the select. Um, tool and that does the same thing as pressing the S key to toggle into select mode, as I discussed. Um, here is the same thing as toggling into the add mode by pressing the A key. Um, and there's a number of different features. This toggles into drawing buildings. Um, and these are some of these are plugins that I've downloaded, um, and some of them are other options. And then there's other important options at the top here, like you can undo redo actions that you've done. There's a search function that I'll get to in a little bit um, and a number of different options here. And then over here at the right, um, there's also um, the important toolbars. Layers is one of the most important because this is where you see all of the data that you have downloaded. Um, but as you can see, I have a number of different other layers that I could use over here. Um, that I, you can pin them or you can open and close them. Kenneth, sorry um, to interrupt it. Your oh, screen isn't totally showing Jossum. It's a bit difficult to see the layers bar. Can you make Jossum large screen? Yeah, yes. Full screen is what I mean. Yeah. Is, did that fix it? No. No. Okay. There um, we go. That did it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So, yeah. So hopefully you can see it now. Um, this is what I was discussing is these, um, this toolbar to the right shows you a number of different windows. And here you can see um, your different layer options. Um, okay. So, oh, something else to go over um, is map um, navigation. And so these are basically just your three key um, ways of interacting with the map. One of them is the right mouse button. And I'm um, using that right now. Um, I have toggled into the select mode using the S key on my keyboard. And now I'm right clicking and dragging the map around um, because that right click button is what allows you to pan around the map. Um, and then your left click button is what allows you to um, interact with features. So now I'm left clicking and I selected this feature. 
Um, and when I get to editing, um, I will also be left clicking to create and alter features. And then lastly, I'm using my scroll wheel on my mouse to zoom in and out from the data. Okay, so jumping back to adding imagery that I was just um, discussing, um, the project, this project suggested using Bing imagery. So I'm going to go to the imagery menu bar and pull down and select Bing aerial imagery. Um, and here we can see that the imagery has popped up. Um, Richard, if you can hear me, one question that was coming up um, was if there's a way to see the date that um, the imagery is from and any associated metadata. Um, I attempted to see if I could figure this out and the best that I could find was right clicking on it and bringing up this info layer, but um, this info didn't seem to have um, the dates or a few of the other metadata pieces that people were asking for. Um, but anyway, so our imagery is up and by zooming in and comparing to some of the edits that have been made, we can see that this building, this road, everything looks pretty well aligned. Um, but if it were not, what we could do is imagery offset. And so you can see here, um, adjust imagery offset, use arrow keys or drag the imagery layer. Um, if it were not aligned, I would drag the imagery around until it matched up and then click OK. But I'm going to cancel because it is already aligned. Um, OK, so now I'm going to talk about the draw tool. Um, and most of this has already um, been mapped. There are a few more things to map. So I'm going to just going to be sort of drawing over here in the corner because it's already pulled it up. Um, but the first thing that I discussed was creating nodes. The first thing that I want to do is toggle into the add mode by pressing the A key. And you can see that my cursor has changed to this plus sign. I'll switch back to select. You can see the arrow in the little box and that's the select. Um, but once I hit the A key and switch over to add, then it becomes the plus sign. Um, so to create a node, as I discussed, you want to double click with the left mouse button. That creates one node and now I'm done. If I wanted to create another node, I could double click again or again. Um, and if I were only creating nodes, then I would click back to the select mode once I was done and move on to tagging this. Um, but switching back to the add mode, now to create a way, I'm gonna click once. And then here you can see the segment bar coming off of it. And I'm gonna click again for the whole distance of my way. Again, here I'm sort of just editing in this forest, but um, in reality, if I were creating this road over here, I would be um, tracing along the pathway that already exists. So to finish off my way, I'm just going to double click. Let's say I want the last node here. I've double clicked and now that segment is no longer following my cursor because this is complete. Um, and then you can switch back to select and it's there. Um, and then the last thing is creating an area. I'm going to switch back to add mode. Just like creating a way, um, you click once with the left mouse button where you want um, nodes to appear. But importantly, you double click on the same point and then switch back to S. And now your area has been created. So that's a brief overview. Um, however, there's a few important things here. First of all, most buildings um, are going to be square or rectangular. Um, and so one thing that's extremely useful, I would say, is the buildings plugin. Um, and I have downloaded that from the plugins as I overviewed um, at the beginning of this. And so by pressing the B key, you can now see that a little building pops up next to my plus sign. I'll toggle back to A and you don't see the building. And now I'm back, I've just pressed the B key and you can see the building there. And what that is going to do is um, create rectangular or square buildings. And so I'll just give a brief demonstration, but if I wanted to create a building here, the building is already squared for me and it has already been tagged as a building, which are two very important steps. Um, something else that you can do is if I wanted to create a courtyard as we were discussing, um, I could make one building here and then hit S, go back to select mode, 
make sure this is selected, hit V again and go back to building mode. Oops. And then press the J key or shift J. And now it has created one building with a courtyard there in the middle. And this is all selected. And I can move that around. Um, and then another important feature is extrude. Um, so if I'm creating a building and I want an L shaped building, for instance, I double click to add that point here, and then I drag out the part of the building that I want, or I could drag it in. You have a lot of options here, but these tools um, combined with the building plugin make it a lot faster to create square shaped buildings um, than if I were simply making freehanding a building. Um, so I've made a building here, but it's not square, um, there is a fix for this, which is if I press the Q key on my keyboard, it's now square, but it still hasn't been tagged as a building either, which this building has been. Um, so I would highly recommend using the buildings plugin. <clears throat> um, so now moving on to tagging, which is also very important. Um, we discussed a number of different ways that you can add a tag. Um, the first one that I'm gonna show is using the tag slash memberships window over here. Um, with the object selected that I want, I'm going to click this add button with the plus sign. And this window pops up. Um, please select a key. My key is building and choose a value. My value is yes. And I'm going to click OK. And we can see that it's been tagged because the color has shifted. Um, and you can see that the, it's shaded in the center, this area. So um, Jawsome now understands that this has been tagged as a building. Um, however, um, another way that you can go about doing this is using the presets menu. So if I scroll up, up to the presets and I pull down to man-made, I can also select that this is a building. Yes, it's a building. If I had any relevant information, I could fill it out here and then apply preset. And we see that it has also been tagged as a building. So there's a few different ways to go about doing your tags. Um, another thing, and I don't encounter too many circular buildings, but it is useful, um, is there's a few different ways to make a circular building. First, I have toggled into the building mode by pressing the B key, but I'm going to say control C, sorry, option or alt Z. Um, and you can see that the building has sort of changed to a little silo image. And so you can tell that you're in the circular mode. In this case, you simply make two points and oops, and it creates a circular building with the diameter of the points that you created. So doing that again, there's my circular building. However, there is another way to do this. Um, and if I didn't have the building plugin downloaded, a different way that I could do this would be by creating an area and then pressing the O key and it will snap into a circle. Um, another very useful and important feature um, is the way that you can select, move, scale and rotate objects. Um, so focusing on this building, let's say that it was actually, this was not the correct alignment and I want to rotate it. I can hit shift and I can hit control. And then you see those little arrows popping up um, and that allows me to rotate the building, but it's centered around the center point. So the center point's going to stay the same, but everything else is shifting around. So if the building were slightly off of the imagery, I could shift it just a little bit. Um, and another thing is resizing. Um, here I would hit control and option or control and alt, depending on what your keyboard has. And then with the building selected, and with the keys held down, 
you can make the building smaller or larger. So these are very useful tools because you don't have to completely start from scratch on the building that you have made, um, but it allows you to make small edits. Um, another thing is that in most cases, we don't want to have a repeat um, point that's being used by multiple, um, oops, features, um, but sometimes it will happen that they're sharing a point. In this case, it wouldn't really make sense for something like a road that's a pathway and a building to be sharing this point, but you can see that they are sharing one because it has an enlarged square on this node. Um, as compared to, you can see some of the other ones are smaller, um, but there's a quick fix for this as well. If you select it and then press the G key on your keyboard, it will unglue them, and now they have been unglued. Whereas before, when it was larger, if I drag this, the other one's going to come with it because they're attached. Um, let's see. Um, and again, just for the demonstration, you can see that these lines are gray because I haven't tagged them yet, but it's very important to tag every feature that you create. Um, and that's another visual cue to make sure that you've tagged things is once you have tagged something, typically the color will change because there are colors associated with the different tags. Um, and so that's how you can tell um, whether something has been tagged. Um, another thing that you can do is if you want to merge nodes, this would be the opposite of ungluing them. You select both of them by selecting one, hitting the shift key, selecting another, and then hitting the M key on your keyboard. And now they've been merged. And now you can hit the G key. Oops. And they've been unmerged. Um, another thing that I want to review is a plugin called Mapathoner. Um, and this has a lot of um, interesting capabilities. But um, one of them is the ability to batch buildings. And you can create a lot of buildings without um, lifting your, uh, without stopping. Um, so I've toggled into um, add mode. And here I've selected batch circle building. Um, so each time, every two points that I click is going to be a new circular building um, on this. And so I've made my way, but you can see that I have the grouped two nodes. Um, three times, and then I say batch circle building, and it turns into three circular buildings with those diameters of where I put the points. So that's a fast way to make circular buildings. You can do the same with orthogonal buildings, um, but here you need to indicate the three, three out of the four corners of the building, where are they going to be? And then I say batch orthogonal building. And it's created three buildings here that are already squared for me based on the three corners that I laid down. Um, you can also do the same with L-shaped buildings. Um, and then some other important um, features are you can select duplicate buildings. There aren't any in this tile, um, but if you had two buildings that were in the same physical place um, or on top of each other, it would select those. You can also select non-orthogonal buildings, which is very important because most projects will specify that you need to square your buildings in the instructions. Um, so if I say select non-orthogonal buildings, now all of the buildings are highlighted um, that have not been squared. And so this brings to my attention, okay, here's a building and I need to make sure that I hit the Q key so that it gets squared because that's very important. Um, yeah, once you have um, created a number of different physical features, um, another useful plugin is the validation. Um, and so here you can see this blue check mark. If I run validation, it's going to run and analyze everything um, on my map and then give me some warnings of things that I need to look out for. Um, so here's, it, it's pretty useful because um, it reminds you if there's things that are untagged. Here it shows me, okay, there are three untagged ways. Oh my gosh, I forgot to tag ways. That's very important. Um, and so then it actually creates a new layer in the layers showing all of my validation errors. So I can go through and address these. Okay, this isn't tagged. Let me add a tag over here. 
Um, and then it shows a few other issues, unconnected nodes without physical tags. Here's this node. Um, and then lastly, this was already part of the map, but um, it shows that there's a crossing highway and waterway here. Um, but sometimes it'll show larger issues too, or not just warnings, but actual errors. And the errors are more strongly recommended that you address. Um, and then lastly, something to review is the ability to have this search feature. Um, and here, there's a number of different things that you can search up. Um, but for example, if I want to search up all of my buildings, I can say building equals yes here. And this will show me everything that I have tagged as a building. And they're now all selected here so that I can see them and review them. Um, But there's also other options that you can do. Um, I can search water right equals stream. Oops. And now my waterway has been selected. Um, and so that's a very helpful way for it to mass select um, features. And uh, yeah, I think that's most of the things on my list to demo. Um, Richard, can you think of anything that I missed? Hi, Kenneth, I'm gonna jump in. Richard's unable yeah. to mute himself right now, um, but we are at time for the presentation. Oh, sure. So I will say um, if there are any final questions, we have been trying to answer those in the chat. Thanks to May and Maxwell for that. Does anyone have any additional questions that they would like to unmute themselves or share it at this time? We're getting lots of kudos in the chat. So thank you so much for leading that awesome demo and taking on a little more than you were expecting, Kenneth. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees for your flexibility and understanding with the technical issues that we had. Um, and thanks for staying with us during the presentation. Kenneth, do you have any final things to share or May or Maxwell before we end the um, webinar training? I don't think so. Just that we're we're glad that you were able to attend today and um, excited that you wanted to learn more about Jossum and hopefully you learned something. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and I'll leave it at that I will follow up via email with the recording to this presentation and the slides. And also our website is a great resource to reference lots of the things that Kenneth and Richard shared today via documents. If you go to the validation hub section, I will share that link with you right now. Um, there's lots of resources for you to reference that the validation hub has created uh, for you to learn how to use Jocelyn. So I just dropped that link in the chat and we will be posting this recording to the YouTube. But again, I will share that via email. So thank you all for joining us and have a good weekend.